I, I wrote a book called The Sacred Journey where I was really trying to answer that question to myself, uh, having grown up in a family on both sides of which there was no church connection of any kind. They weren't against it, but uh, it just was a dead letter. And, and I was true of my grandparents too. And I thought, oh, how on earth did somebody like me, having grown up in that kind of uh, world, get into this trade? And as I look back, I saw lots of little moments that seemed to point me in that direction in ways that I wasn't even aware of at the time. And I've told a number of them in that book, and there's no need maybe to tell them again, but just a glimpse of something. It was a, one I always remember especially. It was a, in a book full of reproductions of great paintings. There was a, a reproduction of, a, I think, a pastel sketch that da Vinci did for the head of Christ in the Last Supper. And uh, I found it hugely moving, not because it was the head of Christ particularly, but just because it was this wonderfully sad, very Jewish, inward-looking, slightly tilted head. I always remember that, and then and other, other little things. And then uh, how the, the sort of the climactic moment, these are sort of little pointers, little whispers, little stirrings in the wings of my life. Uh, I found myself sort of at loose ends in New York City in whatever year it was that uh, the present Queen of England was uh, crowned. I can never can think what that was, but 50 something. And uh, I went to church. Uh, I, I had been going to a church just because it happened to be next door to where I lived and because I had nothing else to do on a Sunday. And there was this marvelous preacher named George Buttrick, uh, who on that day preached about uh, the temptation of Christ and uh, said how when uh, Satan, in effect, offered him all the kingdom of the earth, if he would only uh, worship him, and uh, Jesus turned it down. And Buttrick said, uh, unlike the queen, who just accepted a crown in Westminster Abbey, but he said, uh, uh, Christ, nonetheless, has been crowned again and again in the hearts of people who believe in him. And then came this moment, which I really did, I, I, well, who knows, maybe some other moment would have done it, but. He said, Christ is crowned in the hearts of those who love him or believe in him amidst confession and tears and great laughter. And I was so taken aback by great laughter that I just, I found the tears springing from my eyes. And to this day, I, I, I really don't know all that uh, that phrase, great laughter, means to me or meant to Buttrick, but uh, it was, a key moment, the laughter of incredulity, that it might be true, it, maybe it's true what they say about him. And if it is, oh, how marvelous that would be. Or whatever it was. Anyway, that was the moment. And then uh, Buttrick, uh, I'm happy to say, never became my friend. Because when ministers become friends, then they're not your ministers the same way anymore. I never knew him personally well, but I knew him enough to go talk to him. And I said, I think I, uh, I've got to find more about Christianity, because he was so aflame with it and so eloquent with it. And uh, I think I have to go to a seminary. And he said, no need to do that. He said, you can join the church. I can tell you books to read. And I said, well, I want to do something more than that. And that was where, as I've written somewhere, he said to put on your hat. And he went and got his hat. And he got his car out of the garage. And he drove me from Madison Avenue to 74th Street, this busy man, this great big church, all the way up to the top of the park and across 108th Street and up Broadway till we got to uh, Union Seminary and introduced me to the Dean of Students of wonderful New Testament scholar named John Knox. And uh, I signed up and that was how I got to be a minister.